Yeah, well, at that point, we uh, Phil Carson had um, um, come up with Victory Records, which was a um, uh, Japanese-funded uh, JVC, I think, uh, funded him with this label, and and Phil, you know, with the best intentions, uh, you know, like wanted Yes to make this album uh, that was real good, and, you know, and as I said. Once again, yes, we're on the cutting edge of uh, new technology. And uh, the album just went on and on and on forever. You know, a couple of years. I, 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 you know, I played bass on some of the songs, uh, you know, and then two years later when it was being mixed, I wasn't even sure if it was me even playing anymore. You know, it was like, and I know it wasn't Alan drumming anymore. It was like, a, you know, he had been through the kind of uh, the machinery of invention and no one's to blame for that but that that's what the the time was so in, in a way talk was an album that became very very uh had a high musical aspiration john sang very well on it and uh had some very um good uh authentic uh, lyrical kind of meaningful ways of course everything he sang was moved around to sound like uh, Trevor wanted it to sound but it, it worked but it took forever it was ridiculous and you know there there we came out with really probably the first manipulated computerized album and so I had to you know because I've always been a fan of new technology I had to applaud it on one hand, and then on the other hand, I thought, well, you know, the soul of Yes has kind of been put on one side to uh, appreciate this other side. So how much of your bass playing do you think was actually on the album? Uh, in terms of minutes? Or? Uh, I think it was all me, but the, 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 <laughs> the gear mania of like how can we uh, put Chris's bass with this synth sound and mix that together and then put that back through this discombobulated uh, uh, piece of machinery uh, and the whole like enthusiasm for that kind of um, period of time when all these things were available it, um, it was hard to tell at the end of the day yeah, after we'd um, done a sort of a worldwide tour with uh, uh, with the Talk album, um, we got back home, and as I said, uh, you know, California was my home at the time, where most of us resided. Alan White had moved to Seattle, and um, I guess uh, times were changing, and. Um, I think Trevor's ambition was always to try and crack the uh, film music market you know, because um, he was kind of, uh, uh, he was ready made to, to be the person to be able to do that, having a knowledge of scoring and um, you know, piano and, and orchestral arrangement. And um, ultimately, I think that was his goal. And... Uh, and uh, what well, that's what he's doing now, and uh, so yeah, it, it came to a parting of the ways basically. Did he call you to say he was leaving, or, or did you? I, I don't really remember. I think we were both just um, talking about the idea of you know, uh, where we, are we going to go next, and uh. You know, I think uh, pretty much, um, you know, we knew that there was a time for a change. And, um, you know, it, 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 these things just happen. Um, you know, he wasn't fired or he didn't really leave. You know, we were, it was just like a, you know, a conversation that was ongoing. And, you know, and, and obviously he, he had his sights set on that direction so it kind of suited everyone
because there was some suggestion that he was fired from the Inter. Is that true, what you're just saying, or is that not true? Uh, no, I don't think anyone really uh, has ever been fired from me. I think people just get um, fed up with me, is what happened. <laughs> They can't stand me anymore. They have to go. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, no. As I said, it, it, it was just um, a natural progression, and uh, you know, and um, and it's so uh, that decision um, has served Trevor very well, you know, to go into the field is in there. And then after that, of course, then there was the reunion, wasn't there, with the uh, original members? So you had the classic yes back again. Um, was that uh, sort of fortuitous after uh, Trevor left? Well, that then became a different kind of um, era. And as you, yes, you know, that's when John Brewer became involved um, and allowed us to go and uh, record. Uh, in San Luis Obispo, uh, where we eventually did a couple of shows at the end of the recording, uh, and uh, turned that into a, you know, a DVD package and everything. And it was it was a neat idea in a way that Yes was only going to play you know these two shows in this kind of like um, Spielberg type American town, you know in in middle of uh, California, you know. Uh, so it had its charm to it, and and it was quite interesting the way in the the uh, uh, sincerest and diehard fans kind of gravitated to that. And it was a good time, you know. We had, we had this bank that had been uh, gone out of business, and uh, we just sat up in there and made an album, and it, it was a lot of fun. So Chris, uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about La Chasse and, and Wardour Street? Yeah, well that's where I met John, um, you know, and that was uh, actually a, a drinking club that was just, uh, you know, um, sort of the, above and to the left of the marquee. And, uh, and a lot of the musicians who played uh, at the marquee in those days um, they used to go in there for some light refreshment. And I was one of those, and one day I, I was in there and I was introduced to John uh, by Jack Barry, uh, who was the owner, I believe, of the club. Uh, he was always in there anyway. And, um, you know, so that's uh, really the Shas Club. Uh, was quite, uh, you know, quite famous in this day as a watering hole. Right. Thanks. And... Uh, I've got a place down here. He had a rehearsal room in the basement of the Lucky... I don't know, the Lucky Horseshoe or Shaftesbury Avenue? Yeah, the Lucky Horseshoe, just over there. Um, that was uh, a place here we rehearsed in the basement. It was a, a cafe and, um, you know, our, uh, the, we went down there. It was terrible, of course, because we had to hump all our gear up and down the stairs. And... Um, uh, you know, we had to, um, uh, this is kind of difficult, we had to, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, I remember it was a very short, a steep stairway uh, to, to take the gear up and down, and, and we used to sort of rehearse there, and then every time we'd go and do a show, we'd rent a van, and then we'd, um, we'd pick up the gear from the rehearsal room, and then we'd bring it up, uh, and... Uh, Put it in the van, and drive to somewhere like Plymouth or Devon, or, uh, no, Plymouth isn't Devon, isn't it? Or Cornwall, or something like that. Do the show, unload the gear, of course, you know, play the show, and put it back in the van, and get back to the Lucky Horseshoe around, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning, unload all the gear back down into the um, rehearsal room, and then I drive everyone home. So um, it was good training for one's stamina. You know what I mean? Uh, well, no, it was just, you know, I saw a lot of uh, interesting acts down there in those days. You know, the uh, Pink Floyd played there. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I saw John uh, uh, Brewer's, no, not John Brewer, 
I, played, I saw um, Steve Howe uh, playing in the, the band he was in, Tomorrow. They, they were regulars um, down there. And, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, that, the kind of psychedelic scene, and just like this light is going, going psychedelic uh, as we speak. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, it was just uh, a hippy trippy time, you know, that's what happened down there. And, um, you know, and I was young enough to really enjoy it, so. That's great. That was good. Um, um, what about the marquee? You first gig there in August 50, or August 5th, 68? Uh, August 5th, 1968? Um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was an, an interesting time. I, was that when was Sin's first gig there, or Yes's first gig? I understand it was Yes's first oh, gig. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. August 5th, 68 for Yes, yeah. We were, uh, you know, like, it's just starting to tour after we've been rehearsing in the uh, in the basement underneath the cafe. And... Um, I guess because we, uh, the, the fact we knew Jack Barry and uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously he was the assistant manager of the Marquee and he also ran the Chess Club. Uh, we had connections, so yeah, we managed to, um, you know, play there. But of course, my pri pri previous band, The Sin, had had also had a residency there for many years, and um, yeah, spent a lot of time. Uh, playing at the marquee. Yeah. May even hold the record. Um, okay. One, uh, one, one final one. Do you want to uh, go back to the hotel? Yeah, yeah. Have you yeah. Drive and yeah. That's it. We'll we're going past Regent Street. There used to be Boozing and Hawks there. I understand you bought your first Ricky base. Um, yeah, that's right. When I was, uh, I worked there for a brief period of time when I left school uh, as a salesman and. Um, also a part-time packing expert, and uh, basically, uh, yeah, be, while I was there, uh, the Rickenbacker base, they, uh, the, the, the company uh, that I worked for had an associate uh, store, uh, I think it was called Rudel Carts, or something of a strange name, but uh, they imported, um, I think, the first three Rickenbacker bases into the country, and um, uh, Pete Quaif, who was the bass player, with the Kinks, he had one, and then um, following that, uh, I believe John Entwistle had, had bought another, bought the other one, and the third one uh, was in the store, and I just um, uh, grabbed that for myself. And of course, because I worked there, they gave me a very good deal, and uh, that's how I managed to acquire my Rickenbacker.